our Google is now live. Can you still hear me, Shana? I can still hear you. Can you still hear me? Yep. You're, wait, can you test your audio one more time? Uh, ha 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 No, 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 no. I'm not sure why you think that's a helpful audio test. but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's what I do. No, it's okay. All right. And we will begin in five, four, three, oh, two. Crap. You're frozen. Shana? Yeah. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. We will begin in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much for listening to The Geek and the Scribe. The Geek and the Scribe is a culture podcast hosted by myself, Jamara. I am your scribe and my sister, Shana. Hello, I'm your geek. And we look at culture through the lenses of gender and race. And today's show, Shana. Well, Jamara, today's show was actually kind of a special thought that happened this week. Well, it's hard to call it special, but it was a thought I definitely, definitely had. Um, of course, we all know about what happened this weekend in Orlando and the shooting at the nightclub. And I went through some different emotions when I found out. It was funny because I didn't even watch the news that weekend. I didn't find out until I randomly left the house and went somewhere and saw it on, on TV. Mm -hmm. And I remember my first emotion, I was angry. I was so mad. And I was so mad. And I wanted to blame everyone. I wanted to blame the political climate. I wanted to blame people with hate-filled rhetoric. I wanted to blame a society who didn't, who, who doesn't appreciate individuality and doesn't appreciate individualism and people's right to happiness. But as I listened to the news, I started to realize there was another question t people were talking about, and that was faith. And that's always been a prickly subject for me because I've never been very, well, at least my adult life, I've never been very conformed to what people believe I was supposed to believe. And it begged the question of what role faith leads in our life, in our communities. And does it bring us together or does it pull us apart? And it always been my opinion that it should bring us together. So today's show, we're going to talk about faith and what that really means. And one of the one example I'm going to be using today and will be the movie Dogma, mostly because that movie probably explains most of my faith choices more so than anything. <laughs> so that's going to be the bulk of our show today. What about you, Jamar? Oh, that's awesome. So continuing in the faith, uh, today I want to talk about an experience I had this weekend while I was in California uh, visiting the Agape International Spiritual Centers. Um, uh, this particular one um, founded and directed by Michael, Michael Beckwith. And the, I really want to propose a new way of thinking about faith. And, and perhaps it, as my thesis that maybe we as a, as a culture and a society have really evolved and outgrown and our consciousness has expanded beyond the limitations of uh, perhaps what I'll call for right now kind of traditional um, religious belief that's really um, about judgment and kind of good and evil and, and just the idea that maybe it's time for us to think about a new consciousness and also what happens when, when we witness these types of tragedies and events and we feel invisible and how we can use care as, as an anti-capitalist, anti-hate tool. So, it, you know, it's, it's a really tough week. Yeah, it's also a really great opportunity for us to just, like pull back and reflect on on culture and like where we're at. You know, just a pulse check. Mm -hmm. So take us away, dogma. Yes. Now, this is absolutely one of my favorite movies. If you don't know what dogma is, it is a movie by Kevin Smith that came out around 1999. Um, the basic premise is two renegade angels want find a loophole to get back into heaven and 
with the help of a messiah-like character, two unlikely prophets, a couple angels and a dead apostle, they try to stop Armageddon as we know it. That's a lot. Yeah! <laughs> but as zany as that sounds, it brings up very good questions on what we build our faith on. Like, think about, when we have to really think about it. Um, wh what principles do we hold the most important? And even, and so the central religion that they talk about in um, dogma is Catholicism and Christianity, which is fine because those would have been the religions that, that the director are most familiar with, and it was a project that was really brought by his own perspective. So, and since those are two of the largest spread, since that's like one of the largest spread religions in this country, it also makes sense. And man, I, 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 I didn't think the first time I watched this movie it was going to affect me so much, and it really, really, really did. Because not only does it talk about faith, it talks about how faith can change over time, and what happens when it's not allowed to. What happens when you build a whole civilization structure off rules that weren't supposed to necessarily be that finite to begin with. What happened, and I like one thing that they say in the movie all the time, and I'm going to get into more specific, but this is one thing I, I like, because this is the culmination at the end, is they, the main character gets asked, does they have, do they believe? And they say, no, but I have a good idea. And, the pre and that is one of the basic premises of the movie, is that faith, a, be a belief system is much harder to change than an idea. And maybe you can have faith and ideals without building a belief system on it that trap you in a system you can't get out of. Hmm. Yeah, I like that's interesting. Keep going with that. <laughs> um, and that, like, like that, and the bigger question of, of course, there's always that question of why are we here and why, but. The bit, and here's the other thing that I really, really like, is the depiction of God in this particular movie, is that God is thought of as a, almost this quirky, funny, but overall loving character, who, but if you think about it, quirky would make sense if you just look at the world, look at funny little things like the platypus, and you, I can see God having a sense of humor and quirks. Yeah. <laughs> um, And that maybe the way we have decided to view God isn't all what God is. And who was the one who even said that in the first place? There is a character in the movie who's a muse, and she's, she is supposedly is supposed to be a character who helped inspire the Bible. And when she inspired it, she said God was a woman, but the people who were writing the Bible were men, so they put their perspective on it. And is that what we do? to religion over time. As it passes hand to hand, we put our own perspective on it. And does that change the fundamentals of what it is? Right. And, and like also adding to that, you know, do we, do we kind of put a, do we put like one single perspective on it? I know there was a, a really, I, I watched it today uh, in, in prep for this conversation. And there's, uh, there's one quote that I really love. The, is it the Metatron? Am I saying yes. that correctly? the Metatron. Um, and I love the quote where he says, tell a person that you're the Metatron and they stare at you blankly, mention something out of a Charlton Heston movie, and suddenly everybody is a theology scholar. Yes. And I just thought that was so funny because it, it's true because he's like, I am the Metatron. Like, I am here. Like you're talking to me, it's real right now in your face, and 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 the woman, um, the girl, the actress, she was just staring like I don't, I don't know what that is. Yeah, that is nothing to me, you know. <laughs> and then he's just like, you know, mentioned something out of a pop culture movie, and all exactly. of everyone's like, yeah, I know, I know the Lord, you know. Yeah, and that also begs a question: How much do any of us really know about the religions we practice? And I've, man, there have come. And I hate to single out any one group, but it seems to me most um, casual Christians I meet 
don't know as much as most say Muslims or Jews that I meet, but I think that's because they are actually forced to go to special classes in order to learn more about their religion when their children, opposed to Christians, aren't necessarily made to do that. It's more choice with us. Right. But it's also a question, how can you believe in something so hard that you don't know deeply about? And that's troubling, too. What did this movie do for you, Shana? Like, what did it make you stop and, and reflect on in a different way? In some ways, it made me feel less guilty that I didn't, that, man, okay, so I was the only one who felt that there were some issues about the way we, the way religion is presented to us, especially the thought process is that, especially, again, Christian, Judaism, Islam, these are all religions that believe in the same God, but although it is shown, especially Christianity, that God is supposed to be so forgiving and loving, but we don't, aren't necessarily very forgiving and loving to each other, and I've seen too much in life, religion used to bully, to exclude, to push people around, to make people feel less than or that they're not worthy. And there are so many times where I, I want to shake people and be like, wait a minute, you're not allowed to do this. You can't. Because how about even in your own religion, this isn't what's allowed. God didn't say to hurt or hate people. Not and that that has become a prevalent message in a lot of religion, especially mainstream these days, is troubling, especially religions that are supposed to be based off love. And that's, that's sad. And I, it's sad because you see it all the time. You see it in church. Every time, if someone makes a mistake, they are quickly shunned and people aren't very forgiving in a religion that's supposed to be based off forgiveness. It's ultimate forgiveness. <laughs> like, hmm. that's, what, that's hard to swallow. Which, which character really personified that for you in Dogma? Um, or interactions or relationships even? You know what? Um, actually, I could probably go through each character and like be real clear about it, but I'm going to try not to. Like, well, for, I'll start with the main character, though, because she's the easiest. Like, the main character, Bethany, and Bethany represents the loss of faith, and there's a really good quote, actually, in the movie, and it's between the main character and her co-worker right at the beginning, and the co-worker tells her, she's, because the main character says, man, I can't, she's like, I used to be excited about church, I used to be excited about my faith, and she's like, I just don't feel that way anymore. And her coworker tells her, she's like, well, maybe, maybe your faith is like a cup. And what you call it, when you're little, the cup is small, so it's easy to fill. But as you get older, the cup gets bigger, so it's harder to fill. But periodically, the cup still needs to be refilled. And to me, that was a really cool thing, because I even remember being a child and the thought of belief was so easy then. It was so easy to believe in something bigger than myself and that, you know, that there's an ultimate plan and everything's all right. But as an adult, it did become hard. The older I got, the harder it became. Mm. But, it, it, but in some respects, you still need to, as it were, fill that spiritual cup. Like, we all have a need to have some sort of spiritual fulfillment as well as other fulfillments in life. Like, it's, it's all kind of a balance. And if that cup really existed and we still need to fill it up, how do we do that? How do we retain that kind of faith in a world that doesn't, that it's hard to believe in, you know? Yeah. And that was the struggle of the main character, and she needed to figure out through her journey how to how to be open to that kind of belief again. And by the time she's by the time the story's over, they ask her if she has faith, and she's like, "I ha I think I'm burdened with an overabundance." Mm -hmm. <laughs> And we all can't have a pilgrimage from God to, to fix that for us, but 
it is something that we all have to figure out. Like when you lose faith, how do you get back? How do you, how do you, how, I mean, can you make it personal? Like how do you, what, what would you say you've done? I think it's just, mm, I know when I was younger, I would probably say around 19, I had my moment where I didn't believe in anything because I felt like the world had dealt me a crappy hand and I there was nothing left. But it was like a slow process, really. At first, I went and nothing to do with anything that was faith-related. But the more I was open to wanting to, to believe again, the better I felt. Out. And, and the more I healed from the things that hurt me. But bigger than that, it's funny. Um, you know how people always say that, like, especially like really religious folks say, like, they get upset about science, that science is trying to usurp God. Mm -hmm. It was funny. During that time, I got really into science. And to me, science verified something like God to me. Because the more I paid attention to the world around me, the more I cared about the world around me, the more I looked at it, I felt right. like it couldn't be a mistake. I'm like, man, this is way too intricate to not to have a better, a bigger purpose or meaning to it. So that was me. Opinions. Hmm. No, that's really that's really interesting. Uh, so one, I think I, I enjoyed the movie Dogma. Can you hear me, Shana? Yeah. I'm just gonna pause and mic check one two because I can hear myself. Yeah, I can hear me a little bit too. Okay, it's annoying, but what are we gonna do about it? Um, mic check. Can you hear me? Mm, I can hear you. Can you hear the plane passing over my apartment building? Jeez. Um, so for me, I'm gonna take a breath. Three, two, one. So it's it's really interesting um, to, for me to hear you say that because I think one the movie's really interesting the movie Dogma is really interesting for me because it it was this mix of of dark humor and wisdom. So yes, that's why I like it. You know, and it's like really dark humor, and it doesn't. It, I just feel like they use. Because I, I don't think you have to be, everything has to be like, have all these respectability politics tied to it in order to learn something, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and this is where I'm going with your, your connection to science, right? So you can find wisdom or faith uh, via comedy, via, you know, you can use all the words that are available to you in language and still make a point that's that's worth remembering. So that was, that was one piece of the, the movie that I, that I really enjoyed. Um, other than just seeing all those actors. Oh, really, yeah. Oh, my God. They were so young. Baby Matt like, Demon. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow, what are they, 10? I know. Um, you should, so, yeah, you should see some more Kevin Smith movies. You'll see even them even younger, like almost teenager young. Yeah, it's kind of freaky, actually. <laughs> Considering they're like 10, 15 years older than us, so. Yeah. Well, I also keep forgetting that like 1999 is like so far. Oh, like, yeah. Like you know no. what I mean. I keep thinking it's like three years ago, but it's no, actually a lot. No, no, because because you were like because no because I was like what 14 and you were like 18 almost. Yeah. So yeah. Let's let's continue to move on. Yeah. That. <laughs> no. 14 and uh, 17 and yeah no. <laughs> So, I mean, I, that, that aspect of, of the movie was really interesting to me. And then, uh, personally, I think, I don't know, I guess for me, I think I've, I've always considered myself a seeker of some sort. And so, always trying to make sense of my life and its purpose and yeah. the hand I've been dealt. Um, and... And then I never felt like, personally, I never felt like there was any separation between a faith system and science or a faith system and the arts or faith system, a faith system and history or a faith system and anthropology. I feel so like it all lends. 
to each other. Right, exactly. For me, they all work together. And I, I never had that like tension of, well, it has to be one or the other. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's just really helpful to, and I, I consider myself uh, lucky because I think my interactions with religion and with faith have all been by choice, right? So I, I didn't have the experience mm. of someone saying, this is what you have to believe. I was always opt. All right, I need you to, whatever you're doing. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's always it's always been uh, me choosing and, and me discovering and me seeking and me asking a lot of questions to, to the universe. Um, and so this this past weekend, I, I was in I was in Los Angeles, and I am an online member, uh, community member of of the Agape uh, Spiritual Centers, which is this kind of consortium of of spiritual I don't even want to call them churches, but spiritual centers across the country that are founded on uh, Ernest Holmes' teaching, um, which is a science called science of originally called science of mind and really focuses on on this i'm going to just pull up the the text so i don't completely just jack it up but really what they focus on is this idea of of love at the center of all faith uh and so really starting with self-love and so when i when i when i went there i went to the one in in culver city uh which is founded by um uh, Michael, Reverend Michael Beckwith, who actually is actually a pretty controversial figure, um, I think, in, in religious communities, as I think as anyone who thinks outside the box of what religion has to offer yeah. can and will be. And so, but this is the part that really drew me to this community is that they, they really center themselves on this idea that every person is an individualized expression of God. Um, and so every person is made in the likeness and like so pretty much like everything that's in the universe is also inside of you hmm. so like it, it that sounds really simple it does. but it's it's really powerful um so it's like it's always thinking about your relationship with life like so like you live in a body there's life in your body there's also life outside of your body and there's life in other people's bodies so just this idea that you right now on the earth are a unique being who will only be created once for this moment on earth with the rest of us and that inside of you is creative expression is genius is uh is is love and is goodness essential goodness because life is good um and so i don't know i, I was really drawn to that and I, and I started listening to it on on a podcast because they are, there's a few different pod there's one in portland i listen to their podcast there's one in frisco Tech. Texas, I listened to their podcast, and the one in Culver City, um, Culver City, California, that I went to in person over this weekend, I participate on their live stream. So this here's this thing that happened to me, though, when I went there. So you know how normal churches, like, you go to visit, and then they're like, all right, now if you're a, a visitor, please stand up, and, you know, and, like, yeah. sometimes, and sometimes they, like, embarrass you or you know sometimes they're they're just like here's a coupon for the bookstore you know it's always this like weird awkward thing and it's like do you sometimes they make you introduce yourself they're like you're like hi my name is tom i'm from you know and it's like this eh, you know um and so what they did because uh agape centers um of kind of their practices revolve around meditation and affirmation and uh practice and um thing where everyone literally turns to you and like reaches out their hand and like offers you this amazing smile and they they repeat mm -hmm. this this very extensive affirmation to you they're like you are here you have a purpose you are beautiful you are genius you are a creative expression you are here to do amazing things like you are you know like this ultimate like I don't know. It's just this, this long list of affirmations. And, um, you know, I was already feeling pretty good and pretty excited to be there. But I, I was just thinking about, like, how different, how different the world would be if our faith systems were actually built on these affirmations that each and every one of us is this walking creative expression of the yeah. universe, 
um, and like how like we could put down a lot of this like guilt about not being enough and like fallen man and in sin like if you could actually look at someone else and be like wow that person like first of all look at yourself and say wow i am love like i yeah. am beautiful i am uh unique i am talented i am enough like i am able to like bring myself joy and share joy with others you know what i mean um and then you could also look across across the table at the people in your life and and think of them look at them and be like wow this person is unique this person is genius this person is a love affirmation this person is joy you know what i mean um and i i just i just feel like it was a really powerful moment um because how how often are are most people just walking around with kind of negative you know obviously and i'm and i'm not minimizing those thoughts but i'm just saying how powerful it could be if if those weren't our first thoughts about ourselves and how easy it would be to love others if we were also loving ourselves so deeply mm -hmm. um and and also this gesture of care that that that's how they welcomed me it wasn't by like it 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 like almost didn't even matter if I felt insecure or nervous about the moment because they were there to like lift and support and affirm me um, for that, you know, minute and a half affirmation. I don't know. I just thought it was really beautiful. No, I Something think it, about it was just really beautiful. No, I agree. But you know what? Because I think it's something that should probably have existed in modern Christianity, but somehow kind of got lost. Because to me, it sounds so much like the beginning teachings of Christ, where he not only taught people to love each other, but love themselves. Like, he was like, we have to all love each other the same way we are loved, you know? Yeah. So, like, those o o inclusive messages of love were lost. Like, it, and over time, it became a religion more about shame. Mm. It's just sad, really. <laughs> yeah, and and so I, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm just so like oh, this sounds so much happier. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it it felt really happy and it felt really positive to be there. And I think I think their approach of taking essentially all of the wisdom of the ages, so that's like Jesus, Allah, Buddha, um, you know, across the gamut you know, historians, scientists, philosophers, and really taking all of the, the knowledge and wisdom about what makes life really good, they essentially put it together um, as a philosophy and, and a support system for each other. So, yeah, and I, I'm just like, wow, what, what could life, it, it really made me think about what life could be like and, and what practice can be like and what caring for other people can look like. And in, in wake of, uh, this weekend's events, um, Reverend Beckwith released a video today where he talks a lot about self-love and love for others. And he even said, you know, there, there's a time to be, you know, in your spiritual closet and meditating and caring for yourself. And he's also said there's a time to take action. So yeah. it, it, it made me think about what does love in action actually look like? Um, and what, what, are those, what are those possibilities? Um, another thing I, I wanted to mention um, before I hear some of your response is there there's a there's an article that I that floated around Facebook a while ago, and it is written by a I believe a uh, a it's written by a woman and it's called the sick woman theory, mm -hmm. um, and it's written by is it Johanna or Joanna Hedva I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly but it's J O H A N N A H E D V A is the last name. The link is right below. <laughs> yeah, they'll, we'll put the link up. Mm -hmm. And so she talks a little bit about how her experience of having chronic illness and how it essentially left her um, bedridden for really the start and rise of Black Lives Matter. And then at that point, there's there's a quote in the article where she says like, "How can she like throw up throw a brick to protest when she can't even get out okay. of bed?" Okay. Right, and so it's her idea is a, around the article's idea is around self care and caring for others as this uh, anti-capitalist, anti-hate uh, 
mode of protest. And so I thought about that because so many of us are not in Orlando, right? And so yeah. that, and there are lots of us who feel invisible, yet our heart is aching um, for others because yeah. we know that, just simply put it, that like hate is not okay, right? Yeah, it's not and, it's 2016 and, and any act of hatred towards others is just cannot be tolerated. And so um, I, I, I just wanted to mention the sick woman theory as, as kind of a metaphor for those of us who are feeling very far away or very invisible or feeling like we can't be out in the streets um, protesting yeah. to, to really initiate the idea of caring not only for ourselves, but caring for others as our way of protesting, um, as our way of, of speaking up as, as an option, right? Because not everyone can take the day off work to go to a protest, you know, and, and, and not everyone is in Orlando, but, um, but that doesn't mean we can't still care for ourselves and care for others in a way that activates a uh, change in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. Yeah. No, and, and I agree, and I and I think I think largely sometimes what we need to do more, and again, this is just my opinion, but even small acts of kindness to each other, I feel like as a society we've become much less kind, um, that we don't give the care. And I don't mean that we don't care, but we don't give that little bit of care to like those day to day. It's like 40 years ago, if you walked through your neighborhood, you said hi to everyone you saw. You knew who your neighbors were and you cared about them. Mm -hmm. Heck, even when we were little kids, we lived in a, um, my sister and I, we lived in a, um, a, a, the, in the middle of two streets that had dead ends. And everyone in between those two dead end streets knew each other. And all the kids knew each other. And we all played together. Matter of fact, even one of our neighbors, since there wasn't a corner store near our block and we didn't live in the safest neighborhood, opened a store in her kitchen so that the kids wouldn't have to leave the block and risk getting hurt just to get like a teeny juice. And that was a community. And a larger sense of community and responsibility for each other doesn't really seem to be as prevalent as it once was. And I feel like also that maybe we've let small differences like who people love, where we live, what color we are, um, who we're attracted to, who we're not attracted to, um, what music we like, what books we read, what TV we watch, a whole bunch of trivial little things separate us and exclude us from each other in ways that are really unnecessary. Because the truth of the matter is, the person who's most like you may not be the person who looks most like you. You know, like the person who you'll have most in common with in the world may be your physical opposite, but how will you ever know if you don't give the people around you a chance? If you don't give right. other groups of people chances, if you don't give other races, genders, other ethnicities, other religions, other sexual orientations, like if you don't give them all chances, you are missing a chance to meet great and wondrous people who you would have had no idea of otherwise. Right. No, it's so true. I took a class uh, when I was uh, in grad school at NYU called The Blind Date with the Other. And the whole premise of the class was actually to kind of build bridges around artist projects that you were launching and working on in terms of having a diverse group of people that you collaborate with. Can you hear me, mm -hmm. Shana? Sorry, if I look kind of blank, I just can't see. Oh, it's okay. I am. Um, I can hear myself, so I'm just trying to figure that out. So in this in this class, though, it's the idea that you, in order to have, in order to be successful and collaborate and build allies, you actually have to reach out with people outside of your comfort zone mm -hmm. and and find someone who seemingly is different from you, and and collaborate with them and get their feedback and learn about their ideas and um, just reach out for something other than 
whatever you are on, on the surface. And, 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 you know, and obviously in that, in that reaching out, you do find spaces where we're actually more alike than not. And so I guess I, I'm thinking about that as you're talking. And I'm also thinking about practical ways that we can reach out to the other. So there's a lot of us who have friends on Facebooks um, and we kind of make them an other by one, assuming that we're friends, friends. With them, but we actually haven't taken the time to build relationships or check in with them one-on-one -on -one in a personal way and say, yeah. how are you? What, what's going on with your life? Let's chat. Let's have a phone call. So I'm just thinking about ways like that. And then there's obviously places where we go, whether it's school or work or the buses that we're on or the people we meet in the stores where we actually sincerely are interested in someone else. Mm. Uh, and, and, and I think that that comes from actually being kind of secure in who you are and, and loving who you are and recognizing that someone yeah. else um, is out there and, and available for, for you to care for. So yeah, I think I agree with the sense, like, sense of self, like, if you don't, and I, I feel like I've said this to, like, friends of mine, people in my life before, but, like, it's so important to have a sense of who you are and a love for that person. Like, how could you ever have good relationships with others? How could you ever be able to put yourself out there in the world and be a, like, a positive force out there when you can't completely be a positive force on the inside, I guess is my thing? Like, it's so important to love and accept you. And, and like, for me, that was such a, per it was such a turning point in my life, being able to accept me for all of what I was. And it's like... And the moment I started to do that, I felt like everything, it, it was this weird like turning point. It felt like everything about how I felt about everything outside myself changed. It changed about how I mean, how I kept certain relationships close and how much I showed the people closest to me how much I cared because I knew my value. It also helped me put in perspective stuff I didn't want in my life, like things that were toxic, things that were that I found hateful, things that were just unpleasant, made it so much easier to let go of them once I knew what I was worth and how much I cared about me to be happy, you know? So, right. like, I feel like it's that people always talk about that's an important thing in, like, mental health, but it's so... But, why wouldn't it be an important thing in spiritual health? And I don't know why people don't think of it more. And that's why, like, when you told told me about the um, spiritual center, I was like, man, that is a cool thing that finally someone promoting the fact that you really do have to love who you are. Like, how can you share all this goodness in the world if you don't even, you don't own that it belongs, that's there? Right, and that you, and this is not only for you and I, but everyone listening, you actually have the right to pause and love yourself. Yes. <laughs> you have, you absolutely have the right to say, this is who I am. I am this tall, this weight, this skin color, from this background, and I love me. I am it's awesome. my job, it's my job to love me. And um, there's, I also, I mean, I'm into a few different things. I also listen to like Eckhart Tolle and Byron Katie. Those are really my staples in addition to to what I've learned at Agape and um, Byron Katie if, if people don't know she has something called the work which essentially is like three questions that can if you have any stressful thought three questions that can turn it around so the first question is um, is it true uh, is it is it really true and what happens when you don't believe that thought so for example if you had a stressful thought that said um, I'm, I'm, I'm ugly. So then she, she responds, is it true? And you can, you have an option to say yes or no. So you can say, yes, it is true. Okay. It, are you certain that it's true? And then at that point you have another option to say yes or no. So at that point you can, you can say, yeah, I'm actually really ugly. And then the third question is always the turnaround. How would you feel if you didn't have that thought? So, right, even if you, you're up to that point still saying, yes, this is true about me, you know, it's like, well, if I didn't have the thought that I was ugly, how would I feel? Well, I would, mm -hmm. I would feel better. I would feel more confident. I would feel pretty. I would feel permission to, 
to be my full self you know what i mean and so anyway that's just like a quick byron katie yeah. thing but she's actually really kind of a sassy lady um like and, and she, she has this uh, she has really amazing quotes and one of my favorite of hers is that um it's not your job to like me it's mine right yeah because and it also the thing at the end of the day if there's nobody else around who is gonna like you if you don't like you and you have to spend the most time with you of anybody, that's going to be some crappy alone time. Right. right. And I guess it's important for us to say uh, that our, our thought behind kind of going on about this self-love yeah. is that I suspect that those who hate others have a deep yeah. hatred for, for them. themselves. For themselves. Yeah. And that's, that's my that's my theory. I don't know I don't know how I would prove that, but that's my theory. I have a I have a a, a statistic. Well, it's not really a statistic, but a thing that kind of lends to that. If you think about it this way, a lot of the people who are like gay bashers, a lot of them are gay themselves, or at least have had homosexual thoughts in their life, and they didn't know how to handle it. Because they're taught from a very early age, for whatever reason, that it's a bad thing to be. So they lash out because it's part of who they are. There actually was, gosh, I wish I could think of the person who said this quote, but it's essentially we hate other, we hate in other people what we hate in ourselves. Mm. So when we see a certain behavior in somebody else, we hate it because it's a behavior that it's in us and we hate that we do it. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely makes sense because I, there's another quote that's like, those who have been oppressed have a propensity to oppress, oppress. others. You know? But so, I mean, I, I, I guess we, I just want to make sure we're reiterating that we're, we're giving our listeners, um, this is, we're giving you permission to, to practice self-love as an activist tool, as a piece of care, mm -hmm. as, as something that says, hey, I'm going to love myself and that's going to make me available to love and be an ally to others. Um, we are, we are, we are going to wrap up. I, I want, so Shana, while you think of your closing thoughts, I want to, I want to read this quick poem that's written by uh, Mark. I, I don't know how to, if I'm pronouncing the last name. It's Aguar, A-G-U-H-A-R. And uh, Mark, she was a, uh, a mixed media trans artist. And there's a poem titled Litanies to My Heavenly Body. And I want to read the second half of, of this poem. Okay? Mm -hmm. So Litanies to my, hev to my Heavenly Brown Body. Blessed are the sissies. Blessed are the boy dykes. Blessed are the people of color, my beloved kith and kin. Blessed are the trans. Blessed are the high femmes. Blessed are the sex workers. Blessed are the authentic. Blessed are the disidentifiers. Blessed are the gender illusionists. Blessed are the non-normative. Blessed are the gender queers. Blessed are the kinksters. Blessed are the disabled. Blessed are the hot fat girls. Blessed are the weirdo queers. Blessed is the spectrum. Blessed is consent. Blessed is respect. Blessed are the beloved who I didn't describe, I couldn't describe, will learn to describe, and respect and love. Amen. I just think I just think that's a very a great piece and so fitting for how many of us are feeling this week after Orlando and and just an amazing piece just to say that um, blessed are all those who don't fit into boxes and and blessed are those who I could not describe I love you too. Mm -hmm. So yes, like that is like oh that's like one of those like deeply sweet things like I think. For my final thoughts, for the most oh, crap, what was that? <laughs> We're gonna pretend like we didn't hear that. <laughs> I can edit it out. Just start over. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> for my final thoughts, like mostly, like one that was awesome final thought, and it kind of reminds me of something that I used to um hold to, um really strongly when I was a kid. 
um, which were the Beatitudes from um, the book of Matthew. Um, mostly because things like that, I know what it's like to feel per like nobody likes you and persecuted and like the world wants to beat you down, but I think, and this is just me, that we really do, it would be so much more awesome to live in a society with a whole lot more I love yous. And God darn you, computer. <laughs> just breathe, take a beat, and do it again. Yeah, hold on. I'm just going to close that. Hopefully it won't pop back up. Um, huh. Crap, I lost my place. <laughs> um, for my final thoughts, ha ha ha. Um, hopefully I'm not interrupted again. Um, for my final thoughts, one, I think it would be much cooler if we lived in a world where more I love yous and less I hate yous. Um, I know it's a terrible, terrible drag lately that we seem to be more and more living in a world where it's okay to say I hate. And it's okay to say I want to hurt you. And it's okay to cause harm to people and make them feel bad. But to me, I think the obvious, I think there's really only one real cure for it. And that's for us to be kind to each other, to love each other. Because you know what? We are each other. Um, there's nothing different for me than the next woman or the next man or anything other than maybe some interchangeable parts. But, <laughs> like, there's nothing that is in me that's not in somebody else. Every, all of us laugh, all of us cry, all of us feel. And I, it, it would be a much, much happier place if we would just realize that we're all the same kind of human and we're all beautifully and gloriously made. And to respect and love one another. And that would be cool, because that would be the best kind of world we could live. That, that's what would really make a utopia or a perfect society, not any politics, not any amount of money or prosperity that we could ever have. It's just if we could all just be a little nicer to each other. Um, it doesn't take much, and it's not hard to be kind. So a little more kindness, spread it around. Amen. Shayna, I love you. You're my love sister. You. But even if you weren't my sister, I love you. I love you too, Mara. Thank you so much for listening to The Geek and the Scribe. If you are listening, we want to let you know that we love you also. And we're just asking that you take care of yourself and you take care of each other this week. And tune in next week for our show. Thank you so much for listening to The Geek and the Scribe. Goodbye. Goodbye. Also, I want to I wanted to sing uh, uh, George Michael's Faith. Because you gotta have faith. Mm -mm. Oh, you gotta mm -hmm. have faith. Mm -hmm. That you gotta have faith. faith. There. Ow. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> right, it's not even, it doesn't even go, but that's fine. I just want to say. Whatever, sing. you do gotta have faith. You gotta, you gotta believe. You gotta believe. All right, thank you for listening. Freedom. I'll be your father figure. <laughs> Put your tiny hand in mine. I'll actually, actually that's next show song. <laughs> yes, that is. Father figure. All right. Thank you for listening to the Geek on the Scribe. Goodbye.